within the galaxy-spanning empire of humanity in M41, known as the Imperium of Man, a familiar phrase encapsulates the horror of existing as a lowly citizen. We are told to forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim dark future there is only war, and that whatever happens next, you will not be missed. Such is life for the many Imperial citizens who join the Imperial Guard, who fight in local militia or planetary defence forces, those who are sent off-world or into the darkened depths of unmonitored districts within hive worlds, all never to be seen again, their names not counted or recorded, their physical selves never recovered. As I have often noted, while the elite named heroes of humanity fight against the most brutal alien entities, it is the unnamed soldiers who sacrifice themselves in truly appalling numbers, and often not in defining battles of campaigns, but in miserable grinding wars of attrition against not the Xenos, maybe not even the heretic, but against the disillusioned, the twisted, against their fellow humans, which as an adjacent note makes the value in those more specialist human operatives all the more apparent. The Sororitas, for example, while certainly capable of fighting against the Xenos horrors of the Tyranid, the corrupt heretics of Chaos, their very nature finds them purging most often human worlds who have lost their way and turned from the light of the Emperor, for those humans who thought they knew better to face the Holy Sisters of the Ecclesiarchy is a terrifying prospect, with their armour and weaponry making them appear almost invulnerable and truly empowered by the power of the Emperor himself. From the human perspective, the loss of billions of fellow citizens may seem a number that is mentally unquantifiable. You know, I've spoken about humans' inability to really consider loss beyond even double digits, something hardwired into our brains that makes this a challenge, so that when you're talking about deaths in the thousands, the tens, or even the hundreds of thousands, the millions, these numbers we understand to be horrifyingly large, but will ordinarily struggle to visualise or even empathise outside of our own line of sight. For those higher members of the Imperium, commanders, governors, inquisitors, Astartes and Sororitas, and indeed any and all of those officers who belong to the Imperium's positions of leadership, even within the Administratum, making decisions that may condemn a world to planetary annihilation is always a matter for careful and difficult consideration. But in the words of the Inquisition, some may question my right to destroy a world of 10 billion souls, but those who truly understand realise I have no right to let them live. The point is, this disconnect of scale between actions seen as not merely being necessary but unavoidable and essential by senior members of the Imperium compared to ordinary citizens can lead worlds to rebel, push back against Imperial command. Most civilians of Imperial worlds and even base level citizens and members of the Imperial apparatus upon a world have little to any knowledge of the Greater Imperium. They understand it exists, but beyond that, the information is very sparse. The vast majority of Astartes and Sororitas, for example, will themselves never have even entered the Sol system, let alone set foot on Holy Terror itself. So for ordinary humans, their understanding of the wider galaxy is significantly limited. Indeed, on many human planets, the very idea of the existence of Xenos is in itself significantly, if not entirely, doubted. Talk of alien horrors devouring planets, dark beings who slide out from the invisible walls between reality to drag mortals to shortened lives of extreme suffering. These are fishermen's tales, bedtime stories, to scare those who might lose faith or conviction in service to the Imperium and the Emperor. So for many a world of the Imperium, when the horrifying reality of such truths is made painfully apparent, combined with the realisation that there would be saviours, his angels, may not have ordinary humans' best interests at the forefront of their mind, it can be a disturbing and extremely troubling shattering of their own reality. For some, it could be too much to bear, and therein the seeds of rebellion and heresy are laid. They may not bear fruit for many years, decades, centuries, but this is the endless challenge for the Imperium, destroying critical threats with brutal, often disproportionate force with little consideration for the lives lost or the damage inflicted upon an Imperial world, knowing that they did what simply had to be done. Meanwhile, leaving behind a world scarred by this new reality they find themselves facing, and some who would internalise the events eventually lead down a darkened path to then face later purging 
by those who specialise in cutting out the decaying flesh of a contaminated world. Naxos was a world that would face these trials of character, and what little information remains regarding the fate of Naxos has been pieced together by lost documents and broken accounts that were discovered much later by Imperial servants. The recorded information described the aftermath of an engagement and campaign that served no glory was not to be put up on a pedestal as a textbook execution of Xenos scouring. The records merely displayed the suffering and despair of a world who found themselves facing the grim reality of the darkness that envelops all who live in the age of the Imperium. And yes, my voice is somewhat different because I am still suffering from the blight of the grandfather's blessing. Naxos was only given a name due to the discovery of important minerals upon it. Before this, it was simply designated as 88BN7. This naming convention originated from its star 88 Beta Naxos in the region of the reef stars within Segmentum Obscurus. It was identified in M37 by rogue trader Lazelle, who recommended this for mineral exploration. But this would not commence until mid M38. As is often the case with the Imperium, reports and recommendations are not followed up on until potentially even a millennia later. The wheels of the Administratum turn slowly and non-priority actions are inevitably sidelined. Four worlds were initially speculated upon, but Naxos became the clear target for expanding mining operations. It was abundant with inner transition metals which included Zygnite, which can create the adamantium analogue Temporine. There was also discovered fluestine, a component in the production of heat sinks and ignition rings of plasma weapons. A metal alloy analogue incidentally refers to material that is not a traditional metal alloy but exhibits similar properties. Analogues can be created for various purposes, for instance, a ceramic composite might be engineered to have high strength and heat resistance similar to a specific metal alloy, making it a non-metallic analogue of that alloy. Another iteration could be a structural analogue, where while the chemical composition might be different, the arrangement of atoms or ions in the structure can lead to analogous physical or mechanical properties. Such complex processes are not something that would be widely understood by the general masses of human civilization in M41, but certainly it's something that those educated in what qualifies as science within the Imperium would be aware of, including rogue traders, the Mechanicus, and those in specific areas of Imperial academic study. While essentially just a rock in space, Naxos would become a world with a reasonable population given the value in materials it held, and despite its remote location, its capacity and station grade were upgraded so that by early M39 it was awarded a colonial mining charter and designated as Naxos Colony 1. It would steadily become ever more profitable, and with this grit's population and footprint upon the planet. Its sector was proving to be one of the most valuable holdings in mid M39 and early M40. Its worth was so significant that the governor petitioned for a second char to be issued as the workforce had swelled so much to meet demand. The available development area was becoming restrictive, so in 580 of M39 a second colony site was initiated a thousand kilometres west of the first colony site on Naxos. At the height of its production in 340 M40, the Naxos Colony 1 site population was estimated to be 3.5 million citizens. This was a figure it would never reach again. In fact, the population would decline from here significantly from this period through to the late M40, so that by 811 M41, the population was less than half a million. The productivity and value in Naxos had declined largely due to the mineral reserves that remained being less economically viable to extract, a problem generally with all mining operations. Early on resources can be extracted at significant quantities and minimal overheads. Over time, as deeper excavation and extraction are necessary, costs and risks increase to a point that eventually they become barely viable, so that by 785M41 production of Zygnite had all but ceased upon Naxos. And this was then followed by additional external factors coming into play. Within another area of the region opened in 690 M41, another planet became the optimal extraction center for the same ores and materials poured from Naxos, making it even less viable as a mining operation. 
The practical end of operations is in 785M41, and this is what brings us to the inflection point just over two decades later in 811M41. Remote colony worlds are always at a particular danger of Xenos incursions for obvious reasons. They have minimal standing defensive capability, little chance of reinforcements, if at all, and they make appealing targets. Additionally, more remote planets are very often constructed with a sparsely distributed infrastructure, making their operations easy pickings for the likes of the Orcs and the Dark Elder, both known for their hit-and-run raiding, although of course more notably the Drakari. Naxos was far from untouched by such incidents, and had in fact suffered some 39 raids by the Dark Cousins of the Eldari. In the most significant of incidents, as many as 8,000 Imperial citizens died during a single campaign in mid-M40. Later incidents caused significant damage to the mining infrastructure, and the total number of those lost to Dark Raiders could number anything as high as 100,000. But then Naxos entered a period where the raids had, without any notable reasoning, stopped. The Drakari or the Dark Eldar are well known by M41 as being vastly different to their Craftworld cousins, who while often engaging with humans in combat, do so out of entirely more objective reasons. The Drakari, meanwhile, are a singularly predatory race whose actions and motives are born from their disturbing history and hedonistic culture. In a larger sense though, it's unclear specifically what drives them collectively beyond personal ambitions and passing creative gambits for power. One of the most notable aspects of their existence is their penchant for so-called raids on real space. This usually involves the capture of humans in service to the sadistic nature of their culture and their endless worship of pain and suffering. And this is attributed as being central to the Drakari culture, around consuming the suffering of others to sustain themselves. The intense emotions generated through acts of torture, torment, physical and mental suffering nourish the souls of the Drakari, and humans given their emotional depth, their latent, albeit generally borderline register psychic ability, plus their broad capacity for suffering, become very valuable prey for the Drakari. Once captured, humans can find themselves not always immediately put to the grinder of slaughter, but may find themselves a new life among the Drakari. Just unfortunately, a life which sees them subjected to torment servitude within the dark, twisted horrors of Komora, the city of the Drakari deep within the webway. They may be forced into labour, become objects of twisted entertainment, fall victim to the innumerable sadistic desires of the Drakari. For in their oppressive society, the agony of captives is integral to their daily life, a large part of which is focused upon the acquisition and harvesting of souls, which are considered valuable currency in their culture. They are employed in rituals and serve to extend the lifespan of the Jakari themselves. The potency and the value of souls increase when derived from beings that have experienced profound suffering and emotional distress. Consequently, humans become not only a source of emotional sustenance, but also a means to amass powerful and coveted souls for a Drakari individual. Additionally, much like the Craft World Elder, the Dark Elder remain highly advanced in both technology and scientific understanding. Captured humans along with other sentient beings make for excellent subjects in their twisted experimentations, biological research, and just for the artistic merit, creative vivisection. Because much of the Jakari's depraved sense of creativity is also what fuels and drives their society, the suffering of others for their general interest and amusement is well documented. It's not uncommon, for example, to see humans captured and other unfortunate beings being thrown into gladiatorial games where they are compelled to engage in life and death struggles either between one another or against the Jakari for the entertainment of the elite. Such games are really often no true combat experience, mostly they are a grotesque opportunity for the Drakari combatants to display their own artistic skills, in both the means by which they execute an object in the arena, paired with the display and skill they show for the crowd. So Drakari raids into real space generally function in fueling their society's commodification of souls, which truly underscores the sadistic and hedonistic nature of the Drakari. 
fighting in the name of the Emperor during such an incursion to real space and dying defending the Imperium seems in fact a small mercy compared to the fate which awaits those who fail to resist the Xenos. But of course sadly very few could even begin to comprehend the horrors that await them in the darkest depths of the Dark Eldar's labyrinthine city deep within the webway. The defence force of Naxos had understandably maintained an intensively practised defensive strategy to counter these raids of Xenos. The Dark Enemy, however, always appeared with the speed of lightning, travelling on their grav ships sweeping in without warning or sound. On the day of the first assault seen by the Drakari in over 30 years, one major Fodor was commanding the defensive protocols of Naxos. And despite unleashing heavy batteries of their stationary emplacements, the invaders used their cunning to infiltrate through ore processing trench lines and transit channels, leaving the powerful defences of Fodor largely irrelevant. Almost immediately, fighting was being reported in the massive residential hubs 12 and 13 of the colony, as well as auxiliary processing plants for mining operations. As always was the case, the invaders were then gone almost as soon as they had appeared but the damage left an open wound on the colonists and the record of the defenders. Hundreds had perished, but the majority were civilians, less than 100 of the defensive force, but nearly 300 in the residential districts. Mostly this ended up being due to an inferno that swept through the area, but was later determined to have been deliberately seeded by the invading enemy. It was of some honourable recognition that the fire teams of the Habs had prevented the immense fire from spreading further than it had and in containing it saved many thousands of lives. But despite the enemy having vanished, few believed that they had left for good, least of all Major Fodor, for if they had disappeared so suddenly, it was of their own choosing. The re-emergence of the Dark Enemy was enough for the governor overseeing the operations of Naxos to immediately instigate martial law. Mining was suspended temporarily, with many sites being sealed under the recommendations of Major Fodor. This new governor of the planet had been assigned only some 17 years previous and believed Naxos was on the cusp of a new period of wealth and productivity. Investigations of untapped potential in a mountain region looked very promising, and Governor Klauser was understandably panicked that a now resurgence of Xenos incursion could risk the entire planet being declared unviable. Despite Fodor reinforcing his defensive forces with reserves from the mass of miners, there was concern they needed more to resist whatever was coming their way. So they were dismayed to learn that the request sent to the governor who oversaw the subsector for additional reinforcements was then refused especially given the fact that the governor had assured Klauser of his assistance in securing the future of Naxos. His request for a battalion strength deployment of the Imperial Guard fell flat. There were other wars occurring in the region, not to mention influential lords conducting campaigns or crusades of their own. Whether this was a productive use of Imperial Guard resources was another matter entirely, but their response was signed off with a slightly cryptic explanation that he was still examining other options something that both Klauser and Fodor considered little more than an empty bureaucratic phrasing to attempt to save face. So it was a considerable shock when only two weeks later an unexpected and unidentified starship translated into the system and reached orbit above the colony. The two-week period since they had sent a request for aid had been far from settled, but also the Drakari raiders had not appeared again. But this had not prevented rumours and fear-mongering spreading through the colony like wildfire. Any disappearances were being attributed to the dark figures seen in distant hillsides. Every day that passed increased the tensions and sense of panic that hung like a miasma over residential districts. Many of the reservists deserted, some were executed, charged with that crime, and other citizens' lives were claimed in the riots and street disturbances. It's often speculated by Imperial observers that the Dark Eldar deliberately leave significant pauses in between their raids, to allow to increase the feeling of paranoia, fear and general trauma among a populace. While often it's said that people's imaginations conjure images that are far worse than the reality, when it comes to the Drakari, the opposite is more likely to be true. And while they may not know the specifics, most who have seen continual assaults upon them by Drakari raiders know enough to truly fear what they will inevitably soon face. 
So the arrival of an Imperial starship of any kind to such a remote outpost as Naxos had an immediate effect. One might have imagined it would be relief, but in fact it was the opposite. None would have believed that the Imperium itself could have designated resources to arrive so quickly. A dwindling mining colony that was all but unknown? Instead, many drew the assumption that this was the assault that they had been waiting for, and that this was about to be a raid many times larger than had been previously experienced. Civil unrest broke out, and the defence forces had to waste time, resources and manpower in quelling the civilian disorder. Things would become shockingly clear to the governor and local officials when two vessels set down upon the colony, without having made any request or communications to do so, and why they had not became immediately apparent upon the sight of two bulky Imperial dropships, Astartes Thunderhawks. The Iron Snakes were an ancient Space Marine chapter originating from the second founding itself. Their home planet is Ithaca, the planet a vast ocean world, but still containing significant landmass that enables humans to exist upon it. The Iron Snakes recruit from Ithaca, but their fortress monastery is built upon its moon of Charybdis. As with all Astartes chapters, their recruits have to survive various trials. Most of these are always endurance-based, but many of the chapters have specific trials related to their homeworld or history. For the Iron Snakes, one of their key trials is to hunt and kill one of the Leviathan oceanic dragon-like worms which inhabit Ithaca. For it is of course these creatures to which the Iron Snakes attribute their name and chapter symbol. Along with the standard weaponry of an Astartes, they may be seen to wield their oceanic hunting lances for this legendary trial. Despite originating from the Ultramarines, the Iron Snakes demonstrate a storied history using cunning and guile. They appreciate ingenuity and tactical flair pushing the boundaries to achieve objectives. They pay extra attention to their librarian psychers, their thinkers, planners, and open to whatever is necessary to best achieve their goals. One of their particularly unusual battle practices was in having trained to use dogs in combat, especially in tracking and attacking the Dark Eldar. Another noteworthy curiosity is that due to their focus on using tactical squads, this has led them to seeing all squads have an attached apothecary. This being far from the norm, as most Astartes are usually assigned only one apothecary per entire company. While the squad is the principal tactical unit of the chapter, sometimes even less manpower is deployed. In cases of responding to general aid requests from the worlds within the Reef Stars, it is customary to dispatch only one battle brother from the closest Iron Snakes squad to investigate. The brother chosen is often either the newest member of the squad, or a member being considered for the role of successor by the squad leader, a one-person undertaking is seen to be a fitting challenge for such marines. Historically, only one warrior usually suffices in cases of general aid requests, though it is no shame nor judgement upon the individual to request the presence of his battle brothers once they understand the situation at hand and what will be required. Critically for the humans upon Naxos, the Iron Snakes had taken it upon themselves to defend the region known as the Reef Stars, which includes the Naxos system. They had fought off many battles against the forces of the Warp and Chaos, the Greenskin Menace of the Orcs, but they considered the Dark Eldar to be an especially foul scourge, one that they have run into consistently throughout the Reef Stars. So understandably, when a force of some 40 Iron Snakes arrived unannounced on Naxos, led by one Captain Trochus, it was far more than Governor Klauser and Major Fodor could have anticipated in their wildest dreams. The Space Marines had a habit of monitoring routine communications in the region, and it's possible that this was what had alerted them to the plight of Naxos. They had seen fit to intervene. Fodor and Klauser could not get a clear answer though as to whether the governor's subsector had requested this aid on their behalf. They would then further speculate to themselves that the Astartes may simply have been monitoring and intercepting secure Imperial communications. The interest I have when it comes to the intervention of Astartes upon a world comes back to the initial discussion point about the scale of sacrifice. The arrival of the Emperor's Angels upon a world may seem immediately overwhelming for any human leadership and its citizenry. Few if any humans in their lifetime will actually set eyes on, let alone interact with, an Astartes. However, just like an Inquisitor, 
it's an open question as to whether their arrival upon a world brings you relief and salvation, or if things became suddenly somehow worse. A battalion of Imperial Guard is one thing, they have the human perspective, and yes they will grind out a battle that likely leaves an immense casualty list, but it's far less likely to see the Imperial Guard prioritise things in the much bigger picture, over the survival of ordinary humans. To be clear, it very well could do, of course, depending on their orders and the situation, just as there are some Space Marine chapters who will place an immense value on ordinary human lives, even above their own. The point of the matter is, you just can never be sure what kind of Astartes you're going to get. This was the concern of the Governor and the Major. Had things suddenly gotten better for them, or in fact actually a whole lot worse? The Governor could certainly not refuse their assistance, who could even entertain such a scenario? The human administrator of a world turning away the Emperor's Holy Warriors? It would be a ridiculous and completely implausible scenario. This relief was also not at all what they had expected. Both Fodor and Klauser had wanted a large Imperial Guard force not only to defend the world, but one that they could garrison as an ongoing defensive force and deterrent, perhaps for years, especially with the new investigations and speculations into the ore materials on the planet. Instead, they were landed with an Astarte strike team who would certainly expect the full cooperation of all upon Naxos, likely take command of the Major's defensive force and stay for as little or as long as they deemed necessary. Things were not unfolding as they might have wished. A banquet was held to celebrate the arrival of the Astartes, which would have been acceptable seeing as no Dark Eldar threat had been present for weeks, although they apparently attended in full battle armour, which always makes me think how I hoped they had some Astartes-sized chairs hanging around. The Iron Snakes also were recorded as having eaten little and drank only water, so it sounds like quite a wild party. The Astartes were entirely overwhelming for many of the humans present, because until the day of their arrival, most had thought them mythical figures, the stuff of legends, and this can be true throughout the Imperium. Few would doubt the tales and stories of the Emperor and his Astartes warriors, but to actually set eyes upon one, make the myth become real. One sergeant of the Defence Force was recorded as having noted how, I have seen a thing today which I knew only for the storybooks of my childhood, so mighty and broad and so bold that it might have been a statue on the colonnade of the Emperor come to life. I call it it, because it was not a he nor a she, but a thing, like a god. Its armour glowed like the moon, gunmetal bright, and it smelled of sweet oils and sacred lotions. In its fist, five times the size of my own, it clenched a spear twice the length of my body. I think we will live if these gods are with us now. The Space Marines are a terrifying sight to behold. In many ways, they are monstrous. Tall, transhuman warriors who have been genetically adjusted cybernetically enhanced and forged through the fires of war as the ultimate warriors of mankind. For many, the sight of such creations can be as intimidating as it is awe-inspiring, because for an ordinary human who has lived their entire life in a backwater world or within the basic hab districts of a hive city, a space marine is like nothing they will have ever seen before save for towering marble renderings standing tall along promenades or bridging entrances to grand districts. Captain Trochus seemed to be experienced or at least aware at this hesitance among the colonists, and perhaps their uncertainty at being aided by members of the Astartes, not just a reinforcement of Imperial Guard. So Trochus presented them with a letter of assurance, intentioned to calm any concerns that they may have. It spoke of placing trust in Trochus, trust in the eternal benediction of the Emperor, that the snakes would champion the interests of Naxos and its colony and that the Emperor would guide and protect us all. It felt, though, to the humans as generic as it was ambiguous, and Governor Klauser felt troubled enough to exclaim to Trochus that he did not expect any kind of drawn-out war here on Naxos. He retained his sense of concern that somehow things were not right. He sent a desperate message again to the Governor subsector to please send an Imperial Guard reinforcement, but there was, of course, no reply. Things proceeded much as had been expected. Plans were made, defences set, the opinions of the defence forces and Major Fodor rarely requested, but their many materials certainly were. 
Captain Trochus had apparently anticipated a western assault to the colony and built a defensive line along several of the exterior walls, ore pens, mines and refineries. Despite the presence of the Astartes, Major Fodor was collapsing with stress and nearly apoplectic at the seemingly arbitrary decision to place such heavy defences in one position, even demanding to know how they could possibly determine that an attack would come in from the same direction as it had previously, while on the east side of the colony the defences were sparse and thinly guarded. As was typical of an Astartes, Trochus gave a polite but very terse reply that this was the way to protect the interests of Naxos. It was 23 days until the hour since the previous raid upon the colony when they came. The Jakari concentrated their forces together at nearly 600 in the deep canyons to the east of the colony. On their grab vehicles they travelled fast and below Orspex readers striking at dawn and pouring through the undefended flanks of the colony. They washed over the walls, deluging Hab Residence 15, where what can only be reasonably described as carnage ensued. The reserve miners and Hab workers, who had been called into service as some kind of token visual militia, more for appearance than anything else, were all but cut down like cattle, more really of a cull than a battle. They died with little assistance from the defensive forces, certainly not the Astartes. They died quickly, in vain efforts to defend their immediate families and friends, the suffering and the sights that took place almost immediately upon the engagement were abhorrent and for many unimaginable. It was a truly inhuman slaughter. A scrap of recovered documentation revealed one Lomas Drax, a militia, reporting that it was all confusion, terrible confusion. We had been told the Iron Snakes were with us, but where were they? I saw my friends and neighbours perish, cut apart by blade and blast. The devils were upon us. They came striking in on their bikes, cackling as they fired volley after volley into our midst. We had no cover. Other accounts noted how I was left insensible by the air shock. I'm a deaf man now. I saw shapes coming in, and I held on to my friend as we were lifted by the explosions. Then I found a hand was all that I had left hold of him. Crawling in the dust, I saw South Secondary explode. The explosion described by that defender was the secondary mine, which caused the deaths of some 900 colonists. The assault by the Jakari had been devastating, and Major Fodor desperately attempted to redirect his forces, but as always the speed of the Eldor assault meant any attempts to reposition were futile, and Fodor's repeated calls for the Astartes' assistance went entirely unanswered. Five hours later nearly 3,000 colonists were dead or missing, and the Iron Snakes were still positioned on the western side of their colony. No comment or communications to the Imperial defenders had even been made. The aftermath was one of desperation, anger and accusations. The infirmaries were overwhelmed, industrial fires struggled to be controlled, and all fingers were pointing furiously at the Iron Snakes. Naxos, the Governor and Fodor struggled to comprehend the seemingly tactical incompetence of the finest warriors of the Imperium not only positioning such a bulk of defensive forces in one position, but failing to adapt to the situation when it came, not even making any effort at all to at least have helped minimise the damage that was caused. But no one dared to confront them directly, of course. One did not accuse the Emperor's Astartes of cowardice or incompetence. Instead, organic public demonstrations were made, with many reservists who were basically just civilians throwing down their weapons in anger, Members of the Ecclesiarchy attempted to speak, quell the frustration, inspire the demonstrators, but they were largely shouted down or worse. The Governor felt no choice then to speak with Captain Trochus himself. On approaching him though, in the dim basements of the colony complex, Trochus seemed far more of an intimidating figure than he had during their initial introduction. Before the Governor could even speak, Trochus handed and instructed him on the new deployments they wished to make leaving Klauser in a state of disbelief at the astonishing disregard and arrogance shown for the losses they had suffered. The governor summoned the spirit to speak out and raised his protestations to the space marine captain. But Trochus did not respond with anger nor any kind of physical action or official remonstration. He simply replied, you have your assurance, and dismissed Klauser. An emergency meeting was called with Fodor and Klauser, all suffering the same outraged dismay and panic at the unfolding situation. 
they had always understood that the arrival of Astantes would leave things largely out of their control. They had known that there would likely be losses that they would have wished otherwise. But so many, and on the first day, it seemed as if the situation was slipping very quickly out of their control, and they felt obligated to act. Major Fodor was the calmest at the colonial office meeting, attended by his officers, ecclesiarchy members, some from the Defence Force and Munitorum, plus various other logistical officials. Apparently, Fodor's initial frustrations had dissipated, and his military discipline was assessing the situation now. While others remained enraged, he made the case that although things were very obviously in a terrible state, he had to believe that members of the Astartes, a captain no less, could not make such an obvious error without it having some greater meaning, that there was some hidden greater plan that they could not yet see, noting that they were simply common soldiers, not they of the Astartes, admitting to all that whilst he didn't like it, they would have to go along with it. Klauser, having had time to calm down as well, agreed, adding that they had little choice either way. They could either continue cooperating with a plan they disliked, or have no plan at all. They continued to entrust their fate and that of their friends, relatives and co-workers in the hands of the Emperor's Astartes. Whatever happened next would be on their hands. So it was with a sense of despair and resignation that Major Fodor began to dictate to his forces the plans conveyed by Captain Trochus. Plans to his extreme dismay that appeared to be barely any different from the previous deployment. There were a few defenders bolstering a secondary line here, some on a side wall, others distributed around habs and mines. Some heavy machinery and dozers moved in as obstacles and positions from which heavy weapon teams could mount themselves upon. It all seemed very straightforward and nothing that could catch such a relentless and agile force off guard. More strangely, Trochus had requested that their continued efforts to extinguish one of the most persistent blazes that had erupted from the last assault cease, explaining that the mine was lost and will burn itself out. Dealing with it was just a waste of resources. Not entirely untrue, but not necessarily in the interests of the miners in the long term. The Astartes, meanwhile, remained in their previous positions, leaving all the vulnerabilities that existed before, and Fodor felt that he could see precisely what was going to occur. He couldn't begin to understand the reasoning here. Even if this was a deliberate ploy for the Drakari to sweep in as they had previously, it just seemed so obvious that it could surely fool no one. No enemy could be tricked into thinking that they were so incredibly ignorant of the most basic principles of defence. But once again, when the attack came within the dying light of the day, the Dark Eldar poured out from the positions again to the east, sweeping in on the falling sidewall north, and once again, the site that had been the focus for such brutal carnage the day before. And despite having been somewhat cleared of civilians, it was simply a bloodbath. But now a second prong of the Drakari force hit hard into the south primary wall of the colony and then even a third through the smoke wash from the burning mine that had been left to burn out. Combat in the south was reported as having been particularly intense but only lasted for some 20 minutes, a small victory seeing the Eldar withdraw. But the fight on the north side lasted for three hours and once again Fodor ordered reservists to move in, drawing them from the perimeter. Some reports from militiamen reported that they were actively aided by the bloodlust of the enemy. Their continual need to strike death blows to individuals by their own hand gave them a small chance. Albeit a very negligible one, because after only a few hours the ground itself was literally awash with blood and the viscera of so many men from Fodor's defensive force. The Astartes were nowhere to be seen. Fodor's fears of the very worst scenario were confirmed although it was even worse than he had imagined given the absence of the Astartes. So when an additional force of raiders breached the rising sidewall, apparently this was the force who withdraw so quickly from the south side, the speed and force of the assault was unmatched by the brutality and the ferocity, the defenders so exhausted from the slaughter they'd suffered so far, and now the Dark Elder were able to penetrate through into the inner reaches of the colony, the central refinery, the main generation facility. They took some losses of course, but with minimal cover for the defenders, they were very quickly overwhelmed. Fodor now abandoned the east side of the colony where he had been positioned to travel to the central areas west of his position, to personally oversee and command the situation, because if he didn't, who else would? 
as many as 500 Jakari raiders were estimated to have already reached the Central Colony District and many more were pouring in. Fodor was continually checking the status of defending units, retasking them where possible, but it was clear that things were spiralling wildly out of control. The Jakari were focused upon this central refinery, which was evidently something that they had deemed worthy of a continual pressured assault, perhaps as it was one of the most secure sites within the colony. Report fragments repeatedly describe this battle as hellish and infernal, with flames lighting the entire battle, dense smoke increasing the darkness of what would have been otherwise a lit area. Enemy walked out from the darkness and the fog of battle to cut the throats, decapitate and otherwise brutalise defenders before they had even a moment to react. Just before the Jakari were about to breach the central refinery, the Astartes deployed. Trochus himself personally led the assault and broke from cover via lower access positions of the HAB. The sudden and apparently entirely unexpected appearance of Astartes caused the Eldar Raiders a moment of either horror or eagerness for the battle to come. They had little choice now than to engage the Space Marines. To ignore them would be to welcome a swift demise. Within 30 minutes, they had already cut a swath through the Jakari and decimated their numbers. The sight of this and just the appearance of the Astartes in battle at all, of course, rallied the Naxos defenders who threw themselves into the battle with a renewed vigour. The Dark Eldar were now struggling. If they had been relying on reinforcements, they did not come, and their momentum had now stalled entirely. They were trapped amid the burning confusion, the fog of war, with little means to mount any kinds of mass escape. This was apparently Trochus's plan. With extremely minimal numbers of Astartes, he had set this trap so that now as many as 600 Dark Eldar were being relentlessly slaughtered by only 30 Astartes, which may seem almost impossible but given the Drakari were absolutely blood drunk at this point and the reinvigorated forces redirected by Fodor making all the difference. A significant number of the Dark Eldar of course attempted to escape from what was clearly now an extermination event and they tried to slide away into the darkness of a nearby mine complex hoping to dig in, consolidate their forces and eventually flee. To their horror this was only a secondary trap set by Trochus and here they found the additional 10 man squad of the Iron Snakes who brought them swift deaths caught with no cover between two walls of fire. The Drakari had sobered up significantly now and were clearly aware that they had to escape or meet their end here on some miserable backwater mining world. Many were grouping up and attempting to fly out from the direction they had entered the central areas of the colony only to run into yet again another of Trochus's deceptions. The exit route out looked open but as they attempted to flee, they were blasted by all recognition as an immense shockwave hit them. The area had been heavily mined, controlled by Trochus remotely. For the Drakari, their raiding of the first night had been described by survivors as the slaughter of cattle, but now it was they who were the livestock, and Trochus was carefully herding them unwittingly to their impending end. With the fire of his Iron Snake squads, they coordinated carefully to funnel the raiders against a barrier wall created by the hab blocks, and with the raiders numbering now only as few as 200, they were more easily controlled toward the only remaining escape possible, Rising 2 Mine. To the Drakari delight, there were no embedded Astartes within this position. They felt assured that they would now be able to turn the fight around against the considerably outnumbered marines. The mine itself was like a fortress, and the Jakari, having regained their composure quickly, began to embed themselves defensively, sure enough in themselves that they had been fortunate to escape and would now turn the tide, even as many of them were already gloating in the murderous revenge that was soon to come for those Astartes who had tried to break them, a truly massive explosion ripped through the entire mine. The destruction was absolutely total and only magnified by igniting gases. The entire complex was levelled. There was no possibility of anything inside having survived. The force of the shockwave alone would have been enough to suck the air out of lungs, pulp internal organs and anything else flattened under the collapsing rubble which crushed all within. Nothing survived. Trochus and the Iron Snakes had obliterated a Jakari force that was by any measure some 15 times greater than their own. The price for this was multiple raids having inflicted significant suffering 
and an inhuman level of despair inflicted upon a large number of the population, not to mention now a considerably disillusioned militia and civilian leaders who wondered, was this truly how the Astartes fought their battles, using humans as little more than fodder, pawns to be exterminated in brutal and horrifying fashion without as much as a second thought, not even recognition by the Iron Snakes. This was not to mention either the significant amount of damage to the colony and its operations, which left them wondering if it had been worth it at all. Two of the main mining complexes had been completely destroyed, one at the hands of the Astartes themselves. The governor would subsequently file multiple complaints as to how the operation had been conducted. These, of course, went either without response or overruled with generic automated responses. There was some minimal reparation given by the governor's subsector many months later, but only a fractional amount compared to the structural value and losses incurred since. All of this, of course, only increased the decline of the Naxos colony. In the grim darkness of the Imperium, the value of a single human life takes on a variable perspective in terms of its significance. In the defense of worlds, the worth of a life can very often transcend numbers and statistics. At other times, it is very much only a statistic. While a single human life represents the very essence of all the Imperium and the Emperor set out to accomplish, the preservation of humanity itself, individuals can become, through their actions and spirit, a beacon of hope to bolster and renew the resolve of those many thousands or millions of individuals tasked with resisting the darkness that is ever present and seeks to scour all life from the galaxy. Where entire planets are consumed by chaos or xenos invasions, we see those who will always stand resolute against the darkness, allowing their sacrifices to inspire others to fight on, even when the odds seem insurmountable, often with groups of minimal numbers, like a squad of Sorotas, a lone Inquisitor, an Imperial Guard commander. The notion that one person can make a difference no matter how small drives the Imperium's determination to endure. The stories they tell and retell pass this on through the collective spirit of humanity across tens of thousands of worlds. The individual is the nexus of Imperial unity, yet simultaneously the Imperium stands as a vast anonymous entity, a vast bureaucratic machine that swallows human life as greedily as if they were small organisms floating around waiting to be devoured in the endless ocean of the galactic void. The Imperium is not a well-functioning, stable entity either. It is rife with internal divisions, corruption and inefficiencies. Billions of lives surrendered, often simply due to an administrative error. At this scale of view, the contempt and dismissive approach to human life is truly horrifying. Yet at the front line, on the defense of worlds, individual actions carry far more meaning. Any man, woman or even child can serve as a catalyst for unity. A single human life can bridge divides, bringing together disparate factions and organizations to stand as one against a common enemy. In the face of unrelenting threats, the survival of humanity transcends politics and power struggles, reminding all that the Imperium's unity is its greatest strength, its humility and resourcefulness in times of abject desperation. When the greatest pressures are applied, we can see those who will call upon their most unique skills and ingenuity to adapt to what seemed all but terminal situations. The Mechanicus would understand just as much as seasoned veterans, leaders and strategists of the Imperial Guard that the key to all human survival is knowledge. And the Iron Snakes understood this all too well upon Naxos. That victory meant a calculation based upon their accumulated insights to make decisions and guide their forces in the direst of situations. And that while the loss of a single human life is always to be mourned, it is the collective survival that must always persist. For the death of a world is not just extinguishing the flame of human life, it is the erasure of a repository of knowledge that may have been the key to survival of countless other worlds all throughout the Imperium in the records, accounts and first-hand recordings of what was deemed necessary to bring survival. What scale of sacrifice had to be made? Naxos would survive, but with the damage inflicted, could never recover successfully as a mining colony. Some of its facilities would be converted to chemical production, but these were inadequate, and now the future for the colony looks extremely doubtful. It would become clear much later that the Iron Snakes had in fact detected a major Drakari raiding force 
as early as two years previous. They also fully understood they could not merely strike and destroy such an enemy, they had to bide their time, wait, lay still, allow the enemy to come to them. They would engage and destroy them when the right time, the right place, presented itself. It seems very likely that it was the Iron Snakes who interceded with the governor subsector not to send reinforcements to Naxos, because they wanted the world to appear as a soft and tempting target for this significant force of Dark Eldar, concerned about what damage they could reap on other worlds. They also well understood that they could not actively present themselves as defenders, for the Jakari Raiders never were ones to seek an upfront confrontation. By any measure, they were no orcs. They had to stay out of sight until the Jakari were completely drunk on the slaughter of the colonists and could no longer reasonably coordinate and escape. So the letter of assurance that Trochus had presented to Governor Klauser was a true statement from a certain point of view. They did champion Naxos's interests just from a far greater scale than the Governor had likely imagined or wished to entertain, for the destruction of this Dark Eldar raiding party was something essential to the survival and stability of human worlds that contained tens of billions of citizens throughout the Reef Stars for likely decades and centuries to come. It also demonstrates the difference in thinking between those of the Astartes and higher-up members of the Imperium, comparative to local defence militia and the Imperial Guard. Human life, unfortunately, becomes disconnected from the individual. Strategy is approached with an almost ruthless and clinical disregard for the numbers lost and in the name of the Imperium. The moral choices that are deemed necessary may be uncomfortable for many. For those sacrificed in the defence of Naxos, they should surely know that their lives are symbols of hope unity and resourcefulness. They represent the indomitable spirit of humanity, which stands defiant against the darkest forces that seek to annihilate it. As the Iron Snakes would have it, the Emperor abhors any life wasted in his name, and we fight daily to preserve the value and necessity of sacrifice and understand what it is to have the strength and courage to make clearly and confidently decisions in the heat of warfare.